Hi, everybody. So we're going to look at Chapter 5, Toward Independence, The Years of Decision, 1763-1776. So this section details uh, the immediate incidents and the reasons in the 60s and the 70s that leads to the American Revolution. More than anything, this focuses on the different acts, and an act, by that I mean a law. Uh, these acts of aggression instituted by Parliament. Parliament is the English government, the English legislature that makes the laws, uh, and the king, of course. Uh, these instituted uh, by Parliament and the king on the colonies, and then the responses of the colonies, and then the counter responses from England. This is a response, counter response that goes back and forth repeatedly over more than 10 years. Uh, ultimately, uh, many would say that it's actually forced the colonies to rebel. Well, that's the colonial perspective, the American perspective. England would see it differently. Um, well, well, really, it will really results as a it's as a result of England's inability to really understand what the colonies are becoming. And for years, due to solitary neglect, they left the colonies alone and let the colonies continue to feel independence. And when England came along to say, you're not independent, the colonies said, well, we've kind of grown used to it. All right. So we will start 1763-1765. Um, lots of debt followed England's great war for empire, the Seven Years' War and the uh, French and Indian War. All the same conflict, just different names. Uh, as a result of this, they replaced salutary neglect with increased regulation and taxation. And the colonies are unhappy with that. So there was a big debate in the colonies over about the power of the royal governors. Who really in enforced the power of the king in England across the ocean in the colonies. It was the royal governors and the tax collectors. And a lot of people really complained that the royal governors and tax collectors didn't really have the authority, uh, or they debated about how much authority they actually had. Um, because ideally, they shared their power with the colonial assemblies, with the government. Uh, each colony had its own assembly, its own little legislature, and they shared powers. And the real question initially in the first couple years of this is the balance of that power. Uh, the Revenue Act of 1762 passed by Parliament. It's meant to really tighten control over the colonies, uh, especially the colonies trade with foreign nations. What did England want? England wanted the colonies just trading with England. They didn't want the colonies selling goods to France or Spain or any other country. England wanted to have total control over the goods and the revenue and the taxes generated through those goods and revenue, uh, profits generated. England wanted to have authority over that. Um, eventually, the Revenue Act allows the ships to uh, seize American ships that are transporting goods to other countries, to foreign countries. Um, uh, pretty rough. Uh, they do eventually also have to pay extra taxes. We call it duty. So the col colonials are being told who they can trade with, how much they're going to get paid for it. They have to pay extra taxes to England. And if they don't obey the rules, they could actually lose their ship and their entire uh, cargo of everything, which could be a fortune. They could lose it all. The sailors could be impressed. What is where you actually, they would take the American sailors and force them into the British Army, impressment, or the British Navy. Um... Uh, eventually, England, as a result of all this, England decides to start garrisoning so more and more soldiers in America. Now, the reason for this initially, you go back to the 50s. Remember, the, the, the Seven Years' War is from 56 to 63. So you go back to the 50s, initially putting these military garrisons were the protection of the colonies to protect them from the French and the Indians. Well, by 1762, 63, the war is winding down. And England is still sending over more soldiers to garrison in the colonies. And some of them are actually garrisoning in the cities. Well, the French and the Indians never attacked downtown New York or Boston or Philadelphia. So why are they putting soldiers in the cities? 
it becomes pretty apparent that these garrisons are not just for protecting the colonies from the Indians and French. They're actually being used as a means to coerce the colonies into obeying the laws, the British laws. Because we're moving into peacetime, peacetime increasing, but the number of soldiers increasing as well. That doesn't jive. That just doesn't make sense unless they're there for an ulterior reason, which it becomes apparent that they are. They're really there to try and enforce compliance of the colonies with, with England's new laws. Um, in addition to dealing with the French and Indians, because they did deal with the French and Indians as well. I mean, this was still going on in 62. And even when the war ends, it's still, it isn't exactly peaceful relations between the French, the Indians, the British colonials. Well, one of the reasons England really does this is their debt. Their debt skyrockets. It doubles from 75 to 133 million pounds. And this was the, the money of England is the pound sterling. That's the equivalent to like our dollar. So their debt doubled from 75 to 33 million pounds. Uh, it do doubles over the course of the, year, of the war. Not surprising. War always puts countries into debt. Um, England raised taxes in England. They raised taxes on the poor. They raised taxes on the middle class. They increase uh, different types of taxes, duties, excise taxes. We all pay excise taxes every day. You don't know what you don't even maybe you don't recognize the name. Uh, excise taxes is a sales tax. It's a tax on the poor. If you're rich and you pay your 8% sales tax, you, it doesn't mean nothing to you. You don't even notice it. It means nothing. You never will miss, even miss it. If you're poor, that 8% could be the difference between feeding your children tonight or not. That 8% is the difference between whether they get simply a piece of bread or they actually get some fruit or something. So... Uh, that 8% for poor really adds up. Excise tax, sales tax, which is ubiquitous in America, we have it everywhere, is a tax on the poor. It really is. Um, um, so they increase these taxes. Those with very little, little power are very vulnerable. The poor, of course, very vulnerable. The colonists had no say in parliament. The colonists had no say about laws in parliament or taxes from parliament. So the colonists were powerless to do anything about this taxation, the scarcing of soldiers. Uh, the colonists felt they weren't represented in any way, and they really weren't. Um, they also condemned the rotten boroughs. Rotten boroughs would usually be districts in the colonies that didn't have to pay these taxes or um, were less affected by these taxes. These were typically places that were rich and rich uh, with more money, typically the places where the tax collectors and the governors lived and usually full of much more loyal British citizens, people that still worked and dealt daily or regularly with the English crown. So these were places that were often exempted from the taxes, or they were rich and the tax didn't mean anything to them. Uh, you know, taxes mean nothing to the rich. It doesn't, doesn't cost them anything. They're still rich. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah. These are lands that are often owned by the rich or they're very politically influential having to do with they're either some like royal lands actually owned by the king. The king still owned, technically the, the country controlled and owned the colonies, but some lands in the colonies were still technically owned by the king personally, by his own personal family. Um, and those were exempted as well from taxation. Meanwhile, all the rest of the poor and the colonists had to pay taxes and all this stuff. A lot of people were upset by all this of course. Uh, this just shows how England really came to dominate the world in the 1770s. England is this brown color. England now has control of the eastern half of, of North America. They have colonies in Central and South America, the colonies in Africa, colonies in India, colonies in Asia. And you can see the brown lines. About half of all the trade lines on this map are brown, which indicate they're British which obviously that isn't an accurate representation of the actual trade, but just going by this map, that would indicate that England controlled half the trade in the world uh, across the oceans. That's actually pretty accurate. Uh, by 1763, 1770, England was the most powerful navy in the world. They had the most powerful army in the world. They were the richest country in the world. They had the greatest share of world trade. They were the greatest empire on the globe. Um, and the, uh, 
colonies were taking the brunt of England's uh, punishment. Now that the war was over, England wanted to tax them and get everything out of them because in some ways England blamed the colonies for the war. Uh, the colonies did really start it, although England wanted it as well. It's really sort of a, it's a misdirection because England wanted the war because they wanted to take territory and the trade lines from other countries like Spain and Portugal and France, and they did. So this war is incredibly beneficial to England. Um, this is also a very interesting uh, chart to look at. Look at the debt of England. The debt is the red line, keeps going up. That's military spending and, 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 uh, and, and debt that just keeps increasing. Of course, it goes up every time they fight a war. Here's uh, the Seven Years War. Here's the upcoming war with America. Um, their tax income does increase. That's the green line. Increases slowly, though. Their debt and their war spending far exceeds tax. But really what is even more significant on this map or on this chart is look at the blue line at the bottom. All of the increasing income, green line, all the increasing money spent on war, and what do they never increase their money on? Domestic spending, civil spending on the actual population, on the regular population. England doesn't care anything about its regular population, spends almost nothing on the regular citizens. All they care about is global conquering, global, global domination, imperialism, and they're making tons of money off of it. Just, just from the period of 1690 to 1790, 100 years, England's income, uh, if we say this is about, uh, say, two and a half here, whatever this is based on, two and I guess it's in pounds, sterling millions, two and a half million. hundred years later, it's up to almost 20 million. So that's an increase of, what, seven times, something like that. Seven time increase in wealth generation. Zero increase in spending on the population. All the money is being spent is simply used for world domination. They don't care about their people at all. People are just cogs in the machine. They're just slaves working in the factories. They're just soldiers dying for England. And the colonists fit into this category as well in America. We don't matter. The, co the American colonists don't make a difference. They're just, they're just there to serve England's quest for world domination. All right, next thing we'll look at is George Grenville, Imperial Reform. George Grenville was the Prime Minister, 1763. At this point, taxes were about five times higher in England than in America. So that is something to think about. When the Americans are constantly complaining about high taxes, England's population is actually paying much higher taxes than the colonists ever pay. Here's the difference. England had been used to paying these taxes forever, for centuries. The colonists are going from, in essence, a zero tax to a tax. That's a huge increase. From nothing to a tax is a big increase. England was already used to paying taxes. So when their taxes go up a little bit, it's no big deal. Uh, they just don't really, they're simply the way it is. They're used to it. Nothing you can do about it. Point of my, my saying all this is, therefore, when Parliament chooses to start taxing the colonists, they see it as, hey, you haven't paid any tax at all. This shouldn't be a big deal. Back here in our country, our, our citizens are paying a lot of tax. So the fact that you're paying almost nothing and now we're adding a little bit more onto it, what are you complaining about? You should be happy. You're still paying less than we are back here at home or that the poor and the people, the citizens are paying back here. The colonists see it differently. They see zero to tax being something significant. Um, so they don't see what's going on in England. They don't really care. All they care about is happening in the colonies and they don't want to be taxed. So they weren't paying much tax at all, as I said. Uh, especially when you consider all the illegal smuggling going on. Uh, it's thought maybe a third of all goods uh, going out of the colonies were actually being illegally smuggled to other countries where they didn't have to pay England's taxes, they didn't have to pay duties to English uh, merchants and English tax collectors. They could simply sell it straight to the French or the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Dutch. Uh, so you put all that together and the Americans were often doing some illegal stuff uh, and not paying taxes. 
Sugar tax was passed. The Sugar Act was passed in 64. It put a three penny, uh, I'm, I, pence is the actual term. I'm just going to simplify it and say penny. Three penny tax on every gallon of molasses. It was called this because molasses was used to make sugar. Um, uh, or sugar could actually be used to make molasses. It's actually, you, you, could, you could go back and forth on the process. You could actually tap molasses out of a tree as like a syrup and you could make sugar out of it. Or you could actually make sugar cane into molasses and the molasses could be made into uh, sugar again. Or it could be made into what well, molasses and it was often made into was rum. Uh, rum was also important, uh, very important. Ultimately, though, they weren't paying much tax on it at all. And rum was the most important drink at the time in the colonies. And sugar was a cash crop. People grew it to make money. So you want to make a lot of money on your product, and now the government's coming in saying we're going to start taxing all of that. A lot of people aren't happy. The, the profit margin was pretty slim on it. Uh, so you could make good money on it, but not if the government's going to start taxing it. Now, now and a parliament says you should be happy because initially we were going to charge six pennies a gallon. So we're giving you a 50% break. We're cutting in half. We are compromising with you. You don't want to pay taxes, so we're going to cut in half. Of course, what do the colonies see? A zero tax to a three penny tax. That's a huge increase. The, the idea that you're getting a break by not getting six, no one cares about that because it was zero before or practically zero. So yeah. Uh, many people argue that it would destroy the trade, that this would simply destroy the entire molasses, rum, sugar trade completely from the colonies. It didn't. They also claimed it would destroy the distilling industry. Distilling, which is making alcohol because the rum was made from it. They thought it was, it didn't. Um, uh, people sought ways to avoid the tax, of course. They would bribe officials, you know, look the other way. Don't tax my entire shipload of rum or, or, or molasses. They would, of course, more smuggling. More smuggling, more illegal. If you're going to keep putting more taxes on the goods, we're just not going to pay it at all. We're just going to go and just avoid the tax collectors completely and sell it directly to the French or something. Uh, yeah. All right. This law, Parliament's law, violated the many constitutions in the colonies. Because the colonies, most of the colonies had their own assemblies and they had already written their own constitutions. That in and of itself might have actually been a violation of the law. Um, writing our constitution, in some cases, that's a gray area, whether the colonies even had the authority to do that, even though pretty much all of them had. Uh, nonetheless, they believe this law violates their constitution. So a big debate uh, issues over the idea that this law doesn't originate with the people. The people didn't make this, the people being the colonists, the colonists didn't make this law. Colonists didn't choose that they want to pay it. And they say England doesn't have a right to do this. It didn't originate with us. Uh, England didn't care. England said, you know what? You're our colonies. We can make whatever laws we want to apply to you. Uh, you simply have to fall in line. To make things worse, people that were uh, accused of breaking the law or smuggling or anything like that were arrested, thrown in jail, put in chains. Um, they would be tried by a British judge uh, unfairly, the idea being you aren't getting a fair trial. I mean, it's the British law as you're breaking, right? So if you're being tried by a British judge, you're not going to get a fair trial. You're going to end up losing your property, losing your ship, losing your business, finding yourself in prison, as many people did. And this was interesting, interesting irony here. Many of these people claim they were being treated as slaves of England while simultaneously holding African slaves. Now, don't get me wrong. Only half the people in the colony held slaves. Actually, less than half. But nonetheless, slavery was simply accepted part of society generally. So here we're saying we're being treated as slaves while we have, you know, half a million men and women being held in bondage. Yeah. Um, I don't know if many colonials even saw the irony of that or the maybe the hypocrisy of that. A lot of them probably didn't even realize it. 
uh, yeah. Uh, England argued that everybody, uh, oh, uh, the colonies argued that they were being treated less than English people. They were being treated as second class citizens. Also weirdly hypocritical of the colonists. On one hand, you're saying you shouldn't have to pay the taxes passed by England. And on the other hand, you're saying we're not being treated as English citizens. Those things are really paradoxical, aren't they? Because par English citizens have to pay the taxes. So if you're arguing we shouldn't have to pay the taxes, then you are also simultaneously arguing that you're, you're English citizens, which would imply that you should pay the taxes if England puts the tax. You see what I'm saying? That's um, it's really odd. It's like you're taking a two-sided coin and you're wanting to argue that you know both sides apply at the same time. Uh, it, it's really it's really an odd thing to do. Nonetheless, they did. Nonetheless, they made the argument: Hey, we should be treated as English citizens, and we shouldn't have to pay the tax. That's how the colonists looked at it. Um, ultimately, what is all this about? The amount of money generated from that three penny a gallon on molasses is minimal. It really had very little effect. It didn't suddenly cure the national debt. It didn't. This is about control. This is about England reasserting control after more than a decade of relaxed controls. Salutary neglect. Uh, this is about England starting to reassert its control in the colonies. And the colonists knew this as well. Uh, the intelligent colonists, and by intelligence, that's the wrong way to put it, the, e the educated colonists, the colonists in politics, the ones that were in the know. It's not about intelligence, it's simply about opportunity, status, and having an education. Uh, those that understood all this, it really were in the know, they understood what it was about. They realized this wasn't going to generate hardly any money for England. It's a couple of pennies. Um, even an entire shipload would generate a couple hundred dollars, maybe. Maybe a couple hundred pounds or whatever, maybe. It wasn't about that. It was about control. It really was. Um, they were thought they were being treated as second-class citizens. Uh, because they were living outside of England. Although had they actually been living in England, they would have had to pay much higher taxes. Uh, anything on this I wanted to see? Um, no, that's all right. That's all right. That's Grenville there. It isn't a picture of Grenville. George Grenville up there. He doesn't last too much longer as Parliament, as, uh, pardon me, as Prime Minister. Further, this is actually something you saw in the last chapter. It just shows where the, the money is. The money is being generated largely to the exports of, of goods, typically sugar goods down here, and all their kinds of goods. So all this is royal. Uh, all this is royal. So all of it is pretty much the property of England. Uh, you have a little bit of corporate stuff here, which is business. And propriety, proprietors personally owned property personally owned property by individuals. But all the rest of the colonies is considered part of England. Uh, this is now Spanish Louisiana. The French had it, the French sold it to Spain. Eventually Spain sells it back to France. And then a couple years later, of course, France sells it to us as Louisiana Purchase. Um, no one was using the territory, so they just kept using it as a bargaining chip and trading it back and forth between different countries. All right, Imperial Form, an open challenge, the Stamp Act, our first imperial crisis. The Stamp Act required a stamp on all court documents, all land titles, all contracts, all newspapers, all printed materials. That's an actual picture of one of the stamps. It's like a, it's kind of stamp you might have seen like growing up as kids where you ink it and then you stamp it. You ink and stamp. And so all types of documents, contracts, newspapers, printed materials, court documents, land titles, and the list goes on. Everything required to have a stamp on it. It was a tax. Um, but the fact you had to purchase the stamp on every document, and then the revenue went back to England. Stamp tax. Um, uh, England claims this is required to pay for all the troops in the colonies. The troops and military expenses that the Americans didn't want because they didn't they didn't want the British. The war was over. The war is over. Therefore, there's no reason to have redcoats everywhere. Um, yet there are redcoats everywhere. So it starts to become more and more obvious why the redcoats are there. Uh, the war is over, and yet there are thousands of soldiers all over the colonies. Why? 
Well, England says you now have to pay for all those soldiers, that they've really been sort of unclear about why they're there. Um, so this will cover those soldiers. Prime Minister Grenville says it's either the colonies pay for their own defense or face the or 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 pay the stamp tax. Well, the colonists say we don't need the soldiers; we can take care of ourselves. There's not a war going on now, so we're good. Uh, you can take the soldiers back. And Grenville says, no, nope, no, nope. soldiers got to be there to protect our colonies. We got to protect our investment. So either you got to pay for them or you got to pay the tax. Of course, the colonists don't want either. England says, well, you don't have a choice. It's one or the other. Uh, they go on and, and continue to say we're not being represented in Parliament properly. We don't have representation. We're not being treated fairly. England says, well, no, you're actually virtually represented. What does that mean? Because there's so many English merchants that go back and forth between the colonies and England, that you're being represented that way. Because most of this is about economy. Most of this is about money. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the, the normal day-to-day -day governance of the colonies. This is all about income and revenue. And so the, the income and revenue uh, is merchants. Merchants deal mostly with that, of uh, buying and selling and trading goods. So England says, when it comes to the issues of revenue and taxes and money, you are represented virtually by the merchants that go back and forth across the ocean because they have the best interests of the colonies in mind. Because merchants, at the end of the day, care more about profit than anything else. So therefore, if the merchants say this taxation is okay, it must be okay. Because if it was not okay, they would be complaining about it. Because it would be cutting into their profits. That's the argument England makes. Um, yeah, uh, between America and also the West Indies, the sugar plantations. But no real representation. We're not really going to do this. Now, Ben Franklin actually suggests it. Ben Franklin actually suggests we should put colonists in Parliament. We actually should have elected colonists serving in the English Parliament back in London. And England says, no, no, that's not necessary. Uh, you're represented. Uh, we have the best interest in mind. After all, you're our colonies. We want you to grow and prosper. Therefore, we have the best interests of you in mind. So in other words, shut the F up and deal with it. That's what England's basically saying. Um, furthermore, England goes ahead and passes another law called the Quartering Act. Uh, this, in addition... In addition to the tax, to the stamp tax, so you're already having to pay for the soldiers. In essence, the stamp tax pays the soldiers' salaries. England now says, well, there's a lot more expenses than salary. You got to put them up. You got to have a place for them to sleep. You got to have food and clothing and shelter and, and supplies. You're going to pay for all that. So we're going to pass a whole other law that's going to increase taxes even more. And now you're going to have to pay for the soldiers. Their shelter, their lodging, their home, their food. You're going to pay for all of it. Oh, and by the way, since there isn't just a plethora of empty houses all over the colonies to house thousands of soldiers and their horses and their supplies and everything, you're also going to have to start emptying out your homes, clearing out your, ho your hotels and your motels, all your spare rooms. In other words, every place where it's possible, you're going to have to put the soldiers up. You're going to have to pay the camp tax. You're going to have to pay the quartering X tax. And then we're also going to force you to start putting soldiers up in your homes and feeding them and sheltering them and, and oh, my God, everything. Um, yeah. This was, this, was, this was incredible overreach by England, according to the colonists, and certainly unacceptable. Now we move to the beginnings of an actual talk of rebellion. The beginnings of an actual talk of, we can't continue to put up with this, something must change. Now, this isn't like suddenly everyone's saying, well, let's have a revolution. No, it isn't like that. This happens slow. It's a very gradual process. It's like that, uh, that story about the, the frog that's put in the boiling, in, in the water on the, on the stove and you just slowly turn the heat up. You, you turn the heat up so slow that the frog never realizes it's actually boiling alive until it's too late. Um, because the water just slowly gets warmer and warmer. Well, this is that thing too. This is, this is basically the, the simmer. The, the water just slowly getting warmer and warmer. And more and more problems. 
until finally people start looking around in the 70s and they're like, oh, shit, this is a revolution. But a lot of people, a lot of people didn't really want that or really anticipate that at first. So we're still in 65 here before it really starts to get out of hand. So Virginia, you have Patrick Henry and many others. Uh, they are the ones we will start to call the Patriots. These first men, which are typically educated, elite, upper class, moneyed, uh, land-owning, um, usually politicians, they start talking about making some changes. Not rebellion, but making some changes. They call themselves defenders of America's rights. They publicly condemn Grenville. They, they blame him for all of this. Even though Parliament's passing the laws, they believe Grenville is instigating all this. Grenville is the one asking Parliament to pass the laws uh, regarding the colonies. And they also condemn the king. This was King uh, George III at the time. And they condemn the king. They say the king is also to blame for this. The king is letting this happen. Even if the king isn't making it happen, he's the king. He's letting it happen. So Grenville is doing it. Uh, in conjunction with Parliament, and then, of course, the king is letting it happen. So they condemn all of this. Um, nine of, of the assemblies, nine of the uh, colonies, they send representatives to this uh, Congress, what we call the Stamp Act Congress. It's not an official government body like our Congress. It's a, it, but in this way, Congress simply means a meeting. It means it's a, it's a meeting of people. So the Stamp Act Congress, they are a meeting from nine assemblies. They gather together in New York City in October of 65 at what they call the Stamp Act Congress. And it's to debate the Stamp Act. And, of course, these other things that go along with the Quartering Act. And I'm only actually mentioning a few taxes. There's lots of other things. I'm just naming the big ones. Uh, they protest the loss of rights and liberties. They believe they're losing their rights, their liberties in response to England's actions. And they ultimately declare that only representatives from the colonies can tax the colonies. Only the colonies can tax themselves, is what they declare. If we were going to be taxed, we have to decide on the tax. We, you don't have the right to do this. Uh, you have to be elected by the colonies to decide on taxes. Of course, no one in Parliament's elected by the colonies. And finally, they petition to repeal the Stamp Act. They petition, they send a letter, a signed document to England asking England to repeal, which means to cancel the Stamp Act, along with other things. Um, some members even go ahead and start organizing a boycott, where you stop, or a boycott is where you stop buying the goods. So a boycott to stop buying British goods, to stop doing business with British. If you're going to say we're represented by British merchants who are obviously are making a fortune off of all this, uh, they seem to be doing just fine. We're simply going to stop doing business with the British merchants. Uh, the biggest factor in all this that actually makes a difference in England is the boycott. Because at the end of the day, English cares about, England cares about the trade and the profits. How are you making profits if you're not buying your goods? How are you going to make profits if you can't sell your goods or buy their goods? If trade shuts down, tax is useless. Because how good is a tax on... I mean, how much money do you make from a tax on zero? Anything times zero is zero. So if there's no trade going on, it doesn't matter what taxes you're passed because you're not making any money at all now. So uh, the boycott's probably the biggest action, the biggest factor in all this, uh, which really makes England reevaluate the situation and make some changes. In other words, England compromises some, as I'm going to talk about but only because of the boycott. How do you really hurt England in all this? You hurt them in the pocketbook. That's how you really hurt them. The, 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 that's an old-fashioned term, I guess, isn't it? Uh, the money, you hurt them in their bank account. There you go. Maybe that's more modern. You hurt them in their debit card. There we go. Um, uh, this, uh, November 1st, 1765 is around the time of the boycott starts. We also start to see mob actions. You see images down here. You start to see mob actions of um, crowds, big crowds, uh, gathering around, uh, protests, marching in the street, rallies, parades, burning people in effigy. An effigy is a, is a representation of a person. So they would have like stuffed dolls, think like a scarecrow or something like that. Uh, you can see it hanging from the tree here. 
they would have stuffed figures uh, which would look like certain people. For instance, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson here, tax collectors, things like that, and they would burn them. They wouldn't actually hurt the person, but it gives the impression that we hate you so much, we'd like to see you burn alive. Um, uh, they do this around Boston, New York, places like that. Lieutenant uh, Hutchinson here, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, they burn his house down, chase his entire family and him outside out of the colonies. They have to leave the colonies because they free they they fear for their lives. Um, some of the tactics used here by the patriots would be nothing short of what we would call terrorism. Um, these mobs were often encouraged by the wealthy. The wealthy didn't usually march in the mobs. The wealthy didn't usually run up and down the streets with pitchforks yelling, you know, burn them alive and shit like that. But the wealthy encouraged them. The wealthy wrote articles. The wealthy wrote newspaper stories. The wealthy would speak at big meetings and rallies to get everybody fired up. And then the wealthy, of course, would go back home while the people would then march and rail down the street and, and make noise and, and do things like this. Uh, just about every colony had protests. Just about all of them. This, this was hurting everybody. These taxes and this action by England was affecting everyone. Well, as I said, Parliament does compromise. Parliament Compromise of 1766. Uh, Charles Townsend. Oh, wait a second. I apologize. I almost got ahead of myself there. Grenville is removed. Uh, he's replaced with Charles Townsend, as we'll talk about in the next section. Um, we see increasing violence, this escalation of hostilities. Um, with Grenville gone, this leaves parliamentary factions to push for repeal of the Stamp Act. And we do actually see that. We do see some different factions uh, created in Parliament. We see them debating down here in this painting on the right bottom here. Uh, some people push for to repeal the Stamp Act, repeal the Sugar Act. Um, excuse me. Not because they feel for the colonies, but because of the loss of revenue. Uh, as I said, it really hurts the bank accounts in England more than anything, both private and, of course, the government accounts. So it's about money. The boycott is probably the biggest factor, it really is. Um, some did actually argue that the parliament didn't have the authority to tax the colonies, that the colonies did have some type of independence already, uh, since they already had their own constitutions. Lots of back and forth. Generally, we believe Parliament decides to repeal some of these laws simply because of the money factor, the fact that they're losing all this trade and all this revenue. Um, the Stamp Act is repealed. The Sugar Act is repealed mostly. There's a little caveat for the Sugar Act, but it's mostly repealed. They leave this one penny tax. Um, they leave this one penny tax on there. Uh, and England then goes on to declare, uh, when they respond to the colonies regarding these taxes, and there's a whole statement they make, but the, the, the last quotes may be the most significant. They conclude it with this statement that Parliament and England has the, quote, full power and authority over the colonies in all cases whatsoever. That was the purpose of the one penny tax to say that, you know, we're going to compromise and we're going to strike a deal with you here this time. But ultimately, we have the full power and authority over you in all matters. You are, you are our colonies. You are part of England. We can make laws addressing you the same as we make laws addressing any English citizens. You are, in effect, English citizens. Um, England claims they still have full authority over the colonies, even though they are giving in on this one particular issue. Well, this is a win for the colonies. Most of the taxes that had come about between 62 and 65 are repealed. Now, if it ended right here, there would have probably been no rebellion. There would have been no revolution, not in this time period. If it has ended here. Problem is, it did not end here. A few years later, it starts all over again. 
Charles Townsend comes in and he promises he'll find a new source of revenue, a new source of revenue in the colonies, a new way to generate money for England, the English crown, from the colonies. He starts putting new taxes on the colonies. He starts taxing other things. He starts, uh, the, they're known as the Townsend Acts. There's actually multiple acts. There's multiple of 1767. One of the most um, significant ones, one of the most uh, protested one and, and critiqued one is uh, the duties. The one that applies duties to almost all everyday goods, hundreds of everyday goods that almost all colonists use at some time or another, paper, paint, glass, tea, uh, wood products. I mean, the, there's a long list. These are products that just about every single colonist uses on a daily basis, at least some of them. Um, he puts a tax on all of it. It's a duty, uh, a duty a tax uh, on almost all goods. Um, and this is revenue he claims is needed to pay for the military and the colonists, which the colonists don't want. Uh, it also is claims to pay the salaries of the governors. The taxes, have, they've never had taxes to pay the, the governor's salaries before. Now suddenly the colonists had to pay for the governor's salaries, even though the colonists don't want governors. The colonists would love to elect their own governors instead of the governors being chosen by the king and parliament. They would love to choose their own leader, uh, their own governor, their own uh, leadership. That's not, of course. And the judges, of course. And, of course, the tax collectors. Now, some of these already were colonial positions, like judges, for instance. They then take the judges and they put them on the British payroll. The reasons for this is probably pretty clear. They're taking people that are in authority in the colonies, not the assembly, but in many other positions, and they're putting them on the British payroll to make them loyal to England. So you don't have just the governor representing England in the colonies. You know, I have governors, tax collectors, city commissioners, judges, uh, other offices. In essence, they're bribing them so that they will be loyal to the crown and do the England's business in the colonies to watch over the colonists and to make the colonists obey the laws. It's bribery, in essence, England's doing. Um, certainly, it undermines political power in the colonies. Even though the assemblies are still independent and they're, they're chosen by the colonials, mo most other positions outside the assembly of positions of authority are now controlled or being influenced by England. Pretty smart, actually. Pretty smart. Uh, England has had colonies all around. At this point in time, England has colonies on every continent. Uh, Australia, not quite yet, but that'll be soon. And then we don't count Antarctica. That's you know, We don't really count that. But other than that. Uh, there's other acts that follow, other towns and acts. All of this is to enforce the will of Parliament on the colonies and to punish them. We are now actually seeing laws that are not necessarily about tax revenue. They're not necessarily about paying down the national debt. They're actually to punish the colonies for their, in, their continual noncompliance and disobedience. The colonies know this. They're not stupid. They get that some of these laws are really have no actual purpose in paying down debt, no actual purpose in uh, collecting revenue. They're simply to hurt the colonies, to punish them for resistance. The Restraining Act is certainly one of these. The Restraining Act was uh, enacted by Parliament uh, focusing on the city and the entire colony of New York. What it does is it promises to suspend the New York legislature, the New York Assembly, if they don't comply with British laws. Uh, forcing, which they don't, eventually, they, they have to try, and the, England tries to suspend and actually close down New York's parliament, New York's uh, Assembly, uh, because New York is one of the leading colonies resisting. New York and Massachusetts and Philadelphia are a couple leading colonies resisting the British increase of power and authority. Uh, they're going to take away um, self-government from the colonies. Because remember, even though this taxes is happening, 
most laws and policies and governance is still done by the assembly. It's just a handful of things that are being done by parliament. Everything else is from the assembly. Well, they're now going to shut down the assemblies, shut down all government in the colonies, uh, at least in New York. But of course, if you do it in New York, many people in other colonies would see this as a warning. If they did it in New York, well, they could do it here too. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. This is a whole new step in this wills, contest of wills. Shutting down the governments of, of the colonies, that is, well, that is certainly not allowed. That is certainly not acceptable. And they would write documents back to England, like here, this is actually a document um, uh, from England. This is actually from England uh, with the king's name at the top, George the third regis meaning king royalty king uh this was put at the name the tops of many of the laws even though the parliament passed the laws they're all in the name of the king everything done in a, in a monarchy is in the name of the king or in a few cases a queen when there's a queen so america debates and resists again we're now on stage two they happened with grenville they resisted grenville's laws uh, Grenville and Parliament back down. Grenville's fired. They bring in Townsend, and it happens all over again. Townsend starts enacting laws, and the colonists rebel again and challenge again. Plenty of leaders focus on the intent of the laws. The intent of the law is very clear, to take over governing of the colonies. This is no longer about taxation. Even if some of these laws have taxes in them, this is now really about who has the authority to govern the colonies. England has now made it clear. With the Restraining Act and other laws, it is now clear England believes it is the only authority over the colonies, and the colonies must comply. The colonies are of England, they were founded by England, and you therefore must follow the laws of England. Um, the colonies, though, of course, challenge that and say, no, we can't allow this. We've been over here for too long, we've been independent or quasi-independent for too long, we can't allow you to take away all our authority and independence we've gained. Again, this isn't discussing full independence and revolution. This is just wanting the status quo to remain, the way things had been for years, to where the colonies, even though they were technically British, they still were running themselves. In 1768, Massachusetts uh, Assembly condemns the acts. They actually write, you know the way this works. They would write out a document and a letter. They would send it over to England, and it would literally take six months to get a response. But they would write out the document, everybody would sign it, they would officially send it to England and wait for a response from Parliament, which could be months. They condemn the acts, they create a second boycott of British goods, New York merchants following suit. So this starts happening in Massachusetts, New York, a whole second boycott, just like it happened a few years earlier. Uh, women were significant in this, the Daughters of Liberty. We often called the men, we, I mentioned patriots a minute ago, but all, they were often sometimes called uh, the sons of liberty as well, because they were representing liberty uh, for the colonies uh, or protesting the loss of liberty. So the patriots would be referred to as sons of liberty as well. Well, their wives and daughters and mothers, they start calling them the daughters of liberty. And while we're doing a boycott, the daughters of liberty were very influential. They fill in all the gaps. You cannot law no you can't get beef anymore because beef came from England. Most beef came from England, can't get that anymore. So you start eating bear meat. Where does most textiles and cloth come from? England. England was the world leader in textile production, clothing production. Where'd you get your clothes from? England. Now you can't do that anymore. So you gotta spin your own cloth, homespun cloth. What did most people drink? You don't drink the water. They drank the tea. Tea was the most common beverage. What's key in rum were the most two common beverages in the colonies. So you can't drink tea anymore. You start drinking homemade coffee. Um, so the Daughters of Liberty did a lot of this. And this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, they would churn their own butter, brew their own beer, uh, make their own cheese, and so on and so forth. You can't go to the store anymore and buy this stuff. Because the stores are empty, the shelves are empty. Because the boycott's going on. The way the colonies worked generally, the colonies produced the raw materials, which were then shipped over to England, produced in the England factories with millions of factory workers. 
The manufactured goods would then be shipped back to the colonies. So we would literally produce the material, ship it to England, they make the stuff, and then sell it back to us. That's the way the colonies work. That's the way colonies work. Uh, you would be easier and cheaper to make it yourself here, but that's not what England wanted. That's not what France and Spain and all the others did. They wanted to be in the middle of it all, so they were able to get revenue and profit off of it coming and going. They make profit off of the raw material transport and the buying and selling, and they make profit off of the manufactured goods. That's why colonies are so profitable. If the colonies just start growing and producing and making all their own stuff, then the home country, motherland, gets nothing. Makes nothing off of it. So the motherland, the home country, has to be in the middle of everything. Well, now that the boycott's occurring, the people in the colonies are just doing their own stuff now. And the daughters, the wives, the mothers are really impactful in this. They make a big difference. They're showing patriotism. This is their version of patriot. They don't march on the streets. Women didn't get marching on the streets. They didn't protest. Women had very little to do with writing letters, and, and they weren't in politics, really. So this was the women's acts of patriotism to support their husbands and fathers, the sons of liberty, and the, um, the patriots themselves. Uh, we also see a lot of people that were previously inactive. We see a lot of people that were previously not really politically active increase. We see increased political activism in this time period, which is significant. With the revolution occurs and America becomes official, this increased activism of regular people who often didn't participate in politics is significant. It really is. Um, this boycott spreads all across the colonies. It spreads outside of Massachusetts, New York. It spreads into other colonies. Uh, and by the next year, half of the colonies are boycotting British goods. I'm not saying they're boycotting every single thing. And different colonies may boycott different goods. But generally speaking, England is taking a huge economic hit off of this. Really big. Massachusetts sends a letter, actually sends a letter to England, uh, as again, as I already mentioned. And the letter talked about the grievances and their anger and their frustration and, and all of this going on. England responds. Um, not the way the colonies hoped. England responds by sending another army over. They send over one of their premier, one of their top generals, General Gage. And they send over General Gage with thousands of uh, a trained redcoats, trained soldiers. There's already thousands in the colonies. Now he comes over with several thousand more, like another 5,000 soldiers. Uh, experienced, trained veterans with an experienced veteran general. Uh, that's England's response. You're going to continue doing this? You're going to continue challenging us? Well, we are going to come over and use force. We are going to send over the army. And we are going to force you to comply at gunpoint if necessary. Again, a whole nother step in the line. The, the troops had always been in the colonies for years, but the troops hadn't really taken action. They were there as a visible threat, but they hadn't actually started really taking any action. They were just in the background as, a, as the symbol of England. With General Gage arriving, the troops actually start moving into action and taking action and start doing things. Uh, this has escalated to the next level. By 1770, the economic problems had become so great that England was losing half of all of its uh, trade revenue. It was losing like half of its revenue, uh, having to do with, with uh, the colonists and the rebellion, losing tons of money. Uh, the Parliament believed the problem was the revenue, and that was the only thing that mattered was money. And they discuss, they start discussing what to do. Is there going to be another compromise, another repealing of laws? Because gauge is not making a difference. The threat of force and coercion isn't making a difference. The threat of shutting down governments isn't making a difference. If anything, it's actually making the colonies uh, ramp up their action. It's actually exacerbating the problem. Trade is, is less. The more expenditures of troops and military is increased. And of course, increasing pressure from England's king to fix the problem. 
increasing pressure from government to fix the problem, increasing pressure from the merchants. All these merchants, which so virtually represent the colonists, they're going bankrupt. So what's going to happen? Well, in 1768, these colonists I already covered that. It was all cut in half. They were losing half of their trade. In 1770, a brand new prime minister is elected. Elected, that's, well, sort of elected. Not elected by the people. Prime ministers are chosen by parliament. So they're elected, but they're elected by parliament. So parliament chooses another prime minister. This one is Lord North, Prime Minister North. He comes in in 1770. He argues for a repeal of any of the laws. However, he wants to keep the tea tax. He wants to keep the tea tax on there. And the reason for the tea tax is um, we have to keep something. We're going to repeal several taxes, but we have to keep one. Again, just to show that we have real authority, we're going to repeal many of them and keep the one. So they want to they want to keep the tea tax. We'll take away all the others. Colonists stop the boycott. The boycott ends. Again, boycott number two ends, repealing of most of the laws except for the tea tax. The boycott ends. Non-importation. That's the boycott. Succeeds. Well, right about the same time that it succeeds and happens, we get the Boston Massacre. The Boston Massacre is this image here. A group of redcoat soldiers were surrounded by a mob of over 500 citizens in Boston. The redcoat soldiers feared for their lives. They were surrounded. They were they would have. I mean, if the mob had actually attacked, they could have killed all the redcoats easily. Uh, it was believed to be over 500 people in the mob, and you have a small squad of redcoat soldiers. The redcoats fire on the on the mob, killing how many? About five. Yeah, they kill five people. Hardly a massacre. And again, anyone dying is a tragedy, but it's not a massacre. However, the media, newspapers, and intellectuals, and um, the uh, the different assemblies, they all portray it as a tra a massive tragedy of justice, uh, a massive uh, infringement upon the rights of the colonists, because how they, they play it is like this. Now they're murdering us. Now the redcoats are murdering our people. They are trying, they're treating us second class citizens, treating us as a slaves. They're taking away all of our rights, all of our liberties, and now they're gonna start murdering us in the streets. Interesting enough, our second president, John Adams, actually defended these guys in court. He was a lawyer. He defended the Redcoats in court. You know, this is before the Revolution. And he he won the trial, in essence. I think the officer might have got in trouble. But in essence, he got him off. The argument was self-defense. They had to protect themselves because they were surrounded by a mob. And they were not breaking the law. The Redcoats were ordered to be there by the king. Therefore, the Redcoats had to be there. And the mob should not have been surrounding them and acting like they were in attack. Anyway, that's the way it ended up. There's an argument, though. Here's a discussion question. What could have avoided the Boston Massacre? What could have kept it from happening? The Redcoats were there, surrounded by a mob. The Redcoats believed they were going to be attacked and killed. Possible. Certainly possible. Although the mobs hadn't actually attacked and killed anyone yet. It's possible. Certainly could have been assaulted, beaten, and, and injured or killed. But what could have avoided this? What could have avoided the entire situation? So even though it wasn't a massacre, people died. No one had to die. So think about that. Think about the situation that leads up to this and things that could have occurred that could have avoided this and kept this from happening. Uh, alternative uh, alternative history, if you will. And I'm not really looking, I, I'm saying that wrong. I'm not looking to create like an alternative fictional history. I guess what I'm looking at is what is it that really caused this? What is it that created this situation to where redcoats had to murder innocent civilians in the streets. 
Um, how could it have been avoided? Think about that. All right, the massacre occurs, which really riles people up further, for obvious reasons. Most colonists remain loyal to England. Most colonists did not talk about overthrowing or uh, a revolution or um, anything like that. But they did debate who had the real authority to govern the colony. Even if they were still part of England, the colonies had really been governing themselves for, well, almost forever. Truthfully, the actual connection with England had always been very tenuous. The colonies had generally been left alone to govern themselves for decades. Why now suddenly England has to reinstate its authority? We know why. England saw the colonies slipping out of their grasp. And there were other colonies in the world that were rebelling and having revolutions. We weren't the first to do this. So the idea of losing the colonies, like really losing them, causes England to grab on more, more tightly. Imagine you're in a helicopter and the helicopter dips on its side and your seatbelt comes loose, you start to fall. Before it did that, you were already holding on. You were holding on, but not like tight. Because I mean, you're, you're safe, you're secure, the, the helicopter's level. But when the helicopter goes on its side, and suddenly you start to fall out, you grab on with everything you can. That's what England does. They feel the colonies starting to slip away. And they grab on tighter. Unfortunately, by grabbing on tighter, they make it so restrictive that they actually start to choke the colonies. Even though in truth, the colonies had it much better than your typical English citizen. That's why so many people came here. They wanted to get the frack out of England because England sucked if you were a common person. It was terrible. Taxes were crazy. It was oppressive. So that's why they came here. So I guess that's part of the argument. We came to America to escape the oppression of England because still the majority of colonists are English. And now England is trying to create another oppressive government in the colonies, which was the whole reason we came here. Um, but then the other side of it is you're, you're complaining about having to pay more taxes, which is actually much less than what the English were taxing your own people. So two different ways to look at it. Some in the colonies debated or proposed a dual snake analogy. In other words, you have two snake bodies. Uh, how would I do it this way? <laughs> how does this work? Two snake bodies with one head. In each body, one is England and one's the colonies. And the head is the king. So in essence, we're an independent colony with the king still at top. We're still allegiant to the king. All hail the king and God save the king and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to be sort of independent. England says, you're out of your freaking mind. There's no way. There are no two separate governments here, two separate parliaments all under the king. We're all the same government. We're all the same country. Doesn't matter if you're across the ocean. You're still part of England. You're still part of England. Um, yeah, the king disagreed with this. Parliament disagreed with this. They said there's no possibility of two separate governments. There is only one government, and that is... English government, England's government, one parliament, and the king is king over everybody, and forget it. You're just out of luck. Um, these are some of the patriots. I mentioned Patrick Henry before. Benjamin Franklin, they're in the middle. Sam Adams, not to be confused with the beer. Um, these are some of the patriots, some of the well-known patriots. You might like wonder where Washington is in all this. Washington was a loyalist at this time. Washington was loyal to England. Washington had not been turned yet to, <laughs> to the other side. Washington was not really participating in any of this stuff at this time. He was a British officer. He was, he was actually a redcoat before uh, he became where he came to us. He was a loyalist to England. Uh, he doesn't really switch to our side till really close to the end. By the end, I mean the end of all of this before the war. 
to really, really the time of the actual revolution is when we actually see Washington sort of come to our side. Uh, for, for all this period of time here, he's a loyalist to England still. Uh, he would not have been considered a patriot at this time period. It's interesting. Um, this shows you where the soldiers are. Most of the soldiers are up here in this area at the time of the war. By 1775, look where all the soldiers are. New York, Boston. Majority of your soldiers are here in this area between New York and Boston. There's no Indians there. There's no French there. It becomes very obvious as time goes by, the soldiers are there for one purpose. And that is to control the colonies, to instill fear in the colonies, obedience in the colonies. Yeah, it becomes very obvious what they're there for. Here we have again the, uh, the I didn't mention that either, what it says at the bottom is Patriot Propaganda. It was. This, this was actually used to show how bad the Redcoats were and how terrible what England was doing to us. How terrible England's uh, oppression was and how the oppression in England was now spreading over to the colonies. This is just one aspect of it. They're now murdering our citizens. Just murdering them in the streets. Even though the reality of this story is far more complicated than that. Uh, historians have looked at it and, and really it was a case of self-defense. The Redcoats were there by orders of the king. They were doing their duty. Um, you know, it really be, it would be almost no different if we had American soldiers patrolling the streets of downtown Iraq, in Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan. And suddenly they got mobbed by a big, a big mob of local people, insurgents, people with weapons. The soldiers would fire to defend themselves. It was self-defense. It's very comparable uh, to that. Um, again, there's a way this could have been avoided, as the discussion I mentioned a minute ago. How could have all this been avoided? What is it that caused all this to happen? This never had to happen. Um, so that's something to think about as a, as a possible discussion question. What is it that led us to this, and how could this whole situation have been avoided? The road to independence. So despite the repeal of the Townsend Acts, I'll move this up. I'll move this down here. I guess you can see it. Excuse me. Uh, these are the duties on paint and tea to pay for the military and the salaries. Animosity does continue. Things do, don't get peaceful. Um, it may have simply gone too far. Uh, neither side really backs down. The Patriots continue their actions, as I'm about to talk about. The Redcoats don't go anywhere. Gage stays, the Redcoats stay. As a matter of fact, more troops come in. Uh, it continues to escalate. Even though the boycott ended, the, the taxes were repealed, most of them. Um, things don't really quiet down. In Massachusetts, for instance, many of the Patriots organize what we call Committees of Correspondence. We see these first ones around 1772. And what is it they're doing? They're writing letters back and forth to each other, what are called open letters. That's where you write a letter, but then it's published in a newspaper usually. So Joe writes a letter to John, and they publish those papers in the newspaper purposefully so that everybody can read them. There, it's a situation where you have the intelligentsia, the upper classes, the educated, the politicians, the leaders of the communities who are the ones that know what's going on. Uh, they are writing back and forth, debating what's going on, debating the situation, debating England's treatment, sovereignty, what, what, should, what should we do, what action should be taken. And these, these letters are written back and forth to each other but they're usually critical of England. Sometimes they write these letters and send them to England as well. They're critical of the king, critical of parliament, critical of the prime minister. Uh, and the major topic is the rights of the colonies. What are the rights of the colonies? They should be delineated and they should not then, once they're outlined, they should then not be infringed upon by England, uh, the crown or parliament. Uh, big parts of the rights or taxation is one of the best, the, the most significant things. Uh, control of the government is huge. Um, all these things are debated and discussed, but for everybody to read. 
And these committees of correspondence begin in Massachusetts, but eventually we see it across all the northern colonies to where the patriot leaders are writing back and forth and basically publicly discussing their grievances with England and possible solutions in the public by publishing them in the papers. Um, the Tea Act was passed in 1773, the following year. Um, this generates even more revenue for England, generates even more. This is not the first Tea Act, but this is the one that's a significant one at this time because it, 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 it specifically creates a, uh, a, a response of the colonies that you, you know, you're familiar with, the Boston Tea Party. Even though this isn't the first Tea Act, this particular one does elicit a very strong response, as I'll talk about in just a second. The Tea Act is to generate more revenue. Uh, tea and rum were the two most commonly drank beverages in the colonies. So obviously selling the tea and taxing it would generate a lot of money. This, of course, creates more debate, more resistance. Uh, uh, the issue of tea, which is so popular, plus, of course, again, it's simply another tax. Colonists simply don't want to pay another tax. Oddly enough, tea was actually cheaper as a result of the tax. I can't really explain how that works out. Uh, I've read it and I don't exactly understand it myself. But however it worked out, I believe the historians who have written about the economists who've written about it, it, it is actually cheaper. The tea becomes cheaper for the common person to purchase, even though there's a, a tax on it. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's a tax. Even if it makes the product cheaper, people are still complaining and upset that there's a tax because it's just another form of control of, of the colonies by England. Uh, some colonists even saw it as a bribe. Uh, the other direction, because it is actually cheaper, it makes the tea cheaper, the way the tax works. Uh, it actually makes the tea cheaper. The tea cheaper. I like that. Uh, it makes it cheaper. Um, some saw it just as bad because they saw it as a bribe. You're trying to bribe us with cheap tea. <laughs> Can't win for losing, can you, Parliament? Um, all that matters was the tax, uh, another type of tax. So the Boston Tea Party is organized by the Committees of Correspondence. The Committees of Correspondence in Boston actually organized this thing. It wasn't private. It wasn't hidden. It wasn't secret. Uh, everybody knew about it. They wanted Boston to come out and see it. They actually invited Bostonians to come out and watch it. Uh, they organized this resistance to the Tea Act in 1773. A bunch of artisans and laborers, artisans, which are like middle class craft, craft makers and shopkeepers and laborers, they come out, they board some ships. Some are dressed as Indians, Native Americans. Some are dressed in regular clothes. Uh, so some are hiding their identity, some aren't. Uh, they throw a lot of the tea into the harbor. Uh, they dump the tea into the harbor. It is the Boston Tea Party. The actual revenue and the actual cost of this was insignificant. I'm sure whoever owned the ship lost a bunch of money. I'm sure. But ultimately, the actual cost to England of this dumped tea is insignificant. It's simply the symbol, the symbology of it. If you're going to tax the stuff, we're not even going to drink it. We're just going to dump it in the water didn't actually across the colonies happen. Most colonies didn't boycott tea and they kept drinking tea, especially because it was cheaper. Um, so some simply accepted the bribe and it's like, all right, well, I get cheaper tea, so fine, I'll drink it. I still don't like your taxing us, but hey, I'm glad the tea's cheaper. Uh, so the, the, it, was some, it was symbolic. The actual effect it had upon the economy or the tea production or the tea trade was minimal, if any at all. Nonetheless, it pissed off England to, to no end. So England responds with, once again, another set of laws, another set of acts. There's actually five in this. I'm only worried about four. I don't. The, the fifth part has to do with Quebec, and I'm, I'm worried about that. So there's four parts to this. Um, this is the Coercive Acts, um, the officially known as the Coercive Acts. England doesn't even, hit, doesn't even, doesn't even hide it. They name the law as coerced coercion. It is to coerce the colonists into obeying England's laws, obeying England's policy. The colonists call them intolerable, though. First, the port bill uh, closes the port of Boston. Uh, Boston, which was a popular, uh, one of the biggest ports in, in the colonies. But, of course, the Tea Party occurred there. 
So they closed the Port of Boston with the Port Bill. Then the Government Act actually annuls uh, Massachusetts charter and government. So they closed the Massachusetts government um, with the Government Act. They annul the charter. They annul the Constitution. They, in essence, declare all authority in Massachusetts null and void, except for England. Number three is the Quartering Act, a whole new slew of laws uh, requiring a whole new slew of policies, requiring further quartering because there's more soldiers coming, more quartering and taking care of soldiers. And then the fourth one is the Justice Act. This says that any type of serious crime in the colonies that in any way uh, uh, affects England, you will then be thrown in chains, thrown on a boat, and shipped back to England to be tried in England, maybe six months or a year later. No due process. You're simply going to sit in chains in a prison for a year or two until England gets around to trying you. And do you really think you're going to get a fair trial? Of course not. So, uh, pretty bad. Pretty bad stuff. Mm, at this point, there's probably no turning around. At this point, so much has happened now. I think if England were just to outright repeal all the laws and apologize for everything, it would simply be too late. I don't think it would even matter anymore. It's the Boston Tea Party, the image here. You see Bostonians dressed, some of them in regular clothes, some as Indians. Uh, some didn't even disguise themselves. And they're dumping boxes of tea into the harbor. Tea or tea blocks. I think a lot of times tea in this time period was actually shipped as like blocks. Like, you can sort of find coffee that way sometimes. You can find coffee in blocks in the stores. I think that's how the tea was, sort of like that. They're dumping it all into the harbor. You see a huge crowd. This was not hidden. This was public. This was like a big public invitation to come and watch this, uh, this resistant action against England. Well, it got England's attention. This is what leads us to the intolerable the course of acts, which move us to the next chapter in this contest of wills section three here section three the road to independence all right so the patriot leaders get together at what we call the first continental congress again this is not an official government like a congress in america it is simply a meeting of people so we see the first continental congress this first meeting of uh, many of the patriot leaders Meeting in Philadelphia, representatives from 12 of the 13 colonies show up. Uh, these are typically people who are part of the assemblies in their own colonies. They show up in 1774. They advocate a few things. Uh, one, many advocate another boycott. Why not? Boycott one and two worked. Boycott one and two got England to repeal laws and really change a lot of things. So why not go a third time? Third time's a charm. People suggested. Some advocate uh, political and military plans, especially England. England, people in New England, pardon me, people in New England, Boston, New England, they advocate political unity. In essence, we all need to create a unified political body, which does happen. And further, we need to actually make plans for military action. And most people want to put the brakes on that. Even in 1774, many folks were like, what are you talking about? You're, you're actually talking about going to war with the most powerful country in the world? We don't even have a military. We got a bunch of farmers running around with some muskets. I mean, we don't even, what do you, must be crazy. Um, you want to go to war with the greatest empire the world has ever known up to this point in time. Uh, no way. So even military action at this point in 74, most people were laughing at it and thinking, you can't be serious. Uh, definitely the New England colonies were ready to fight. Many of them were. The southern colonies wanted total compromise. Southern colonies, the slave colonies, wanted complete compromise. Why? Because the way the trade worked in the slave colonies, it was all trade. Everything in the slave colonies was produced and then sold to the market, all the slave goods, and then everything in the southern colonies had to be purchased from the market. So literally, the entire southern economy was buying and selling, export, import. So, and of course, much of it was with England. So if the actual war broke out, of course, you're not going to be trading anymore with England. You're at war with them. 
So the entire Southern economy would crash, is what most Southerners believe. And even all the way once the war begins, most Southern colonies are still really, really hesitant and really trepidatious about the whole situation. Because they realize an actual war with England, which is our number one trade partner, would sh potentially shut down their entire economy, uh, their entire slave economy. And it, it does, in large part. So the Southern colonies were never really on board with this, for purely economic reasons. Um, uh, the middle colonies and eh, talk about some pot possible compromise discussion stuff like that. So there's alternatives. There's alternatives. Ultimately, what we do is they write a letter. They talk about creating a political government. They actually talk about creating a government, an actual unified government with political leadership, maybe electing a leader of some sort, um, and ultimately a president. They already go ahead and discuss a president. But this is a little different than what we end up with. Their, their actual governmental bodies, they want a colonial parliament with a colonial president, which then report to England's government. So it is a partnership government. We'll have our own colonial government, not individual assemblies, but an actual colonial government for all 13 colonies, a united government that then is still secondary to England's government. So we're still part of England. Um, that was that was probably the most popular discussion debate there. Hey, we'll get to keep our autonomy, keep our government, and we'll still be part of the English Empire, which should make England happy. Yeah, mm, no, not really. They put all this together and they write it into a Declaration of Rights and Grievances. They put it all down. They say the Intolerable Acts must be repealed. Um, uh, England must only have very limited control of the colonies. We're still part of England, but you have limited control of us. They also threaten to cut off all trade completely. The boycott only boycotted certain goods. They actually threaten to cut off 100% of all trade with England, Ireland, uh, the West Indies, anywhere the English has authority to completely cut themselves off from the English Empire. Of course, what that means by, by implying without saying it, because the Americans are still going to have to have trade with other people, they're still going to have to buy and sell their goods, especially the southern colonies. Where is it going to go? All of that trade revenue is going to go into the coffers of Spain or France, which are the ancient enemies of England. England has been at war with Spain and France multiple times over the last several centuries. So you're going to take all of the money you were given to us, and now you're going to take it away and start giving it to our enemies. That's really what that says. Because they know they're going to continue international trade, you have to. Uh, it's just not going to go to them. So they talk about that. Uh, they give them a date, too. They give them a, an ultimatum. They say next year, 1775. By 1775, all this has to happen. You have to give up control of the colonies, most control of the colonies. We're still English, but give up most control. Repeal all those acts. Stop taxing us in every way. No taxation without representation. Um, or we're going to cut off all trade, and you're going to force us to take other actions. Nothing specific about revolution, but it's sort of implied, even if it isn't specifically put out there. Well, England responds, again, perhaps not the way the colonies intended. Some people probably knew they would respond this way. Prime Minister North orders the uh, Redcoats to take action. The Redcoats have been there in a threatening position for years now, but they've really not taken a lot of direct action, truthfully. They really had done mostly behind the scenes stuff, a little bit of crowd control, maybe some peacekeeping in like Boston or New York. Um, but the Redcoats had actually taken very little offensive direct action up to this point. There were occasional the little things here and there, but nothing, nothing major, nothing colonial uh, across the colonies. It changes now. Lord North actually orders Gage to end the resistance in Massachusetts by whatever means necessary. He orders him to end the resistance, to capture the Patriots, and to put a stop to all of this by whatever means necessary. Once you start using terminology like that, that usually leads to war. Once you start talking like that. Um, there were still some people in Parliament that wanted to negotiate, still some, but 
Uh, most people agree that at this point, England has to stand its ground. Because the colonies have given an ultimatum to the greatest empire in the world. If England gives in again, as they have now been doing for in, in some ways for a decade, um, it's going to show England's weak. And England can't be weak. Why can't England be weak? Think about it for a second. Is this just about the American colonies? No. You must understand, we often, cons we often look at America and the American Revolution in a vacuum. It isn't. England was global. England had relations with dozens of world powers, not just in Europe, in Asia, other countries, all around the world. England had a worldwide image to protect. England had colonies on every continent, uh, except for Australia and Antarctica at this point. So if England backed down, and was defeated effectively by these upstart colonies that don't even have a military. They're not even a country. Um, what would that mean to England? England had to protect its worldwide image. Uh, it had to, to show it was powerful. It couldn't back down. If England backed down and let these colonies in North America rebel against them and make the rules, what was going to keep people from Africa and Asia and South America from doing the same thing? They couldn't let it happen. This was about way more than America. We often look at it as it's just about us. It isn't. This was, this was about the world. And England had to make a statement to the world. They had to, they had to crush us. Really. They had to crush us. To prove to all their other colonies around the world, don't do this. You can't do this. Because you do this, we're going to hurt you. And that's what they tell Gage to do. Uh, to use modern vernacular, they tell Gage to bring the pain. Gage uh, starts mobilizing his troops. He starts taking over armories. He starts capturing towns and cities. He starts shutting down governments. He, uh, he institutes a blockade. Uh, if the Americans are not going to trade with the British, they're not going to trade with anyone. That's a naval blockade. They start lining the ships up along the coast. So if the American ships are not going to go to England, they're not going to go anywhere else. They're not going to go to France. They're not going to go to Spain. They're not going to trade with other countries, which would also, of course, potentially give them supplies. You know, if they were trading our goods to England, England might then give supplies. Or, pardon me, uh, France might then give supplies, food and supplies to Americans. They had to stop that. Uh, there is really no going back at this point. This was the last option to stop what was going to happen. If England had responded to the Declaration of Rights and Grievances positively and really backed down, it might have held off this revolution for a while. At this point, I think it was bound to happen, but they might have held it off for a while. But England responds incredibly aggressively and says, nope, nope, kiss our ass. We're going we're gonna to take you down. And so it begins. General Gage had sent his troops all across New England, taking armories. Um, the armories, the, the, the uh, Patriots had set up these armories all across New England and Boston, especially Massachusetts. And they were little military outposts with weapons and gunpowder, even some cannons in a few places, uh, in preparation, in preparation for an attack or preparation to defend against the Redcoats. Well, the Redcoats had been roaming around New England for years now. They knew where the armories were. So they immediately go out and start taking the armory, start capturing the weapons, the gunpowder, the musket balls, the cannons. They're capturing all this. In response, the, the Americans, which are now calling themselves the Minutemen, they've been now training for a couple of years, preparing for this. They're still not nearly trained like the Redcoats. Redcoats are probably the best trained professional military in the world. Uh, eh, Prussians. Prussians may be close as well. Uh, Prussians with a P there, I'm talking about, are really close. Uh, and they were calling themselves Minutemen. They were going to be able to respond in a minute. So whenever the conflict came, they were supposed to grab whatever food and supplies they needed for several days and run off to a predetermined location somewhere in the woods where maybe a town square and all gather together uh, with some weapons and whatever they had to go and fight the Redcoats. Uh, there was a lot of them. As of 1775, there were thought to be over 20,000 Minutemen across New England. 
That's a lot that way outnumbered the British. But the British, of course, had all the advantages. Even though there was a lot more Minutemen, the British were professionally trained soldiers with supplies, equipment, cannon, horses, etc. Uh, and in any situation, one red coat was equal to three or four more Minutemen. Redcoats were trained marksmen. They were trained to, sh I mean, they were just, they were professional soldiers. Minutemen were generally regular Joe Schmoes, farmers and laborers that uh, just sort of knew how to fire a rifle, maybe. Uh, yet there was a handful of actual real soldiers among the Minutemen because some of them had actually been redcoats, like Washington, for instance. But the vast majority of Minutemen were just regular guys who had very little military training. Um, these militiamen, these thousands, tens of thousands, start organizing across New England. Uh, Gage goes and sends his soldiers to Charleston, Boston, Concord, Lexington, Cambridge, uh, all these different towns across New England to start taking all the armories, take the weapons, and to secure these towns to ensure, because they knew the Minutemen were out there. The Minutemen, they've been praying, they've been praying for this for two years. So the, they knew there was this Minutemen and there was this idea of this local uprising of, of the common people. They knew it existed. He then responds back to England and sends a letter and he says, New England is an open rebellion. He says, New England, uh, Massachusetts especially, is an open rebellion. They are ready to fight. They are arming themselves and we are about to start shooting each other. That's uh, in essence what he says to England. Uh, Gage has about 4,000 men in Boston. He sends some over to Concord, and this is where it happens. Outside of Concord in the early morning hours, the first shots occur. This happens in April 1775, uh, sort of between Concord and Lexington, Massachusetts. He sends some soldiers there to, uh, I think, to capture an armory. In the early morning hours, they meet, uh, it's not even light yet, uh, the Redcoats and Minutemen meet. This is just, you know, a group of several thousand Minutemen, uh, a thousand or so Redcoats, something like that. And they parlay. That's the way it was done in, in the British military. Pardon me, that was the way in European military, you parlay. You didn't just suddenly see the enemy and start shooting. Typically, if two armies would come upon each other, the officers would then go out into the middle of the field and discuss. It was called parlaying. Uh, I guess that's from the French word parlay, speak, you know, parlez vous français, you know, stuff like that. Just speak. Um, and they would talk for a minute and they would discuss terms. Hey, are we even going to fight? Where are we? They would actually discuss where they're going to fight at. Hey, do we want to fight right here? Do we want to go over to that uh, other side of the hill? Uh, do we want to wait till the sun is up better? They would actually discuss this stuff like gentlemen, uh, this idea of war, how they're going to gentlemanly discuss it. Then they're going to step back on the behind the, the back of the lines and then let the actual common soldiers kill each other for a few hours. Uh, that's how it worked often. And they stopped this, actually discussed for a minute what's going to happen and what's about to happen. And I'm sure the Redcoats probably asked the Minutemen to surrender and the Minutemen refused, etc. Then there's an older Minuteman who drops his rifle, drops his musket. And this is story has been corroborated multiple times. So it, it, it's, I mean, it sort of seems like a legend, sort of a myth. But it, it, the story has been written about several times, so it may be true. No one knows exactly how it began, but the most common story is an older Minuteman actually dropped his musket and it went off. Because the way the musket worked is you loaded it, you put the powder in it, you put the rod in, you, you, you had a, it was a ball, I think it was a lead ball or something you pushed down, and then you loaded the whole thing up and then you cocked the hammer back and then you, you aimed and were ready to fire. But it was a process. It took a little bit to do. And so it would have been very likely that there would have been Minutemen sitting there with the, the hammer cocked back and their rifles ready to go. Which means if you did drop one on the ground, the jarring action of the ground would cause the hammer to go, would cause the hammer to fall and it would go off. It just would. I mean, that's certainly logical to have happened. And it looks like someone dropped a rifle, the rifle went off, the shot went off, and boom, suddenly people start shooting. The fighting lasts for a couple hours. And eventually the Redcoats retreat. They retreat back to Boston. So many men died. Dozens, hundreds died in this initial fight, this initial shot. Or you might have heard the term, the shot heard around the world. We think a lot of ourselves here. But it's, it's honestly pretty appropriate. We, I mean, we know how it turned out. You know, spoiler alert. <laughs> you know, we won. Um, we did change world history. We really did. We, these little upstart colonies, defeated the greatest empire the world has ever known. 
uh, after this point. So yeah, uh, it really was, it really did change global history by us conquering and defeating England, not conquering, sorry, uh, by defeating England's try attempted to hold on to the colonies. The fighting goes on. It lasts for a couple hours. The Redcoats retreat back to Boston. Um, there wasn't a real winner. Both sides claim victory. Most of the dead were probably Minutemen. Um, that seems to be the way. But both sides declared victory because the Redcoats could have stayed and fought and they would have probably slaughtered the Minutemen. But the issue with the Minutemen is they weren't fighting traditional. They were actually hiding in the woods. They were sort of like snipers hiding in the woods. That isn't how military usually worked in Europe. The soldiers would usually, armies would just meet on a field, tidally open, and they would just sit and shoot at each other until one side gave up. Hundreds, thousands dead, until one side finally waved a flag and said, we surrender, and then the fighting would just stop. It isn't way, like in modern warfare, we don't think of it that way. We think basically you, you fight until one side is decimated, there's nothing left to them to fight. Back then, they would just fight for a while, and then when one side made it clear that, well, obviously we're winning, the other side would be like, well, we're losing, and they would just surrender. It didn't work out that way. So the Redcoats retreat, the Minutemen retreat, no one really wins, everybody loses, and the war really ends. It doesn't just take off immediately. Pretty much for the next year, there's a lot of compromise, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about what to do. Uh, so it isn't like immediately, suddenly we're engaged. It really takes about a year for the war to really take off. Because after these initial shots in 1775, there's a big push for compromise from the colonists. Many colonists say, in essence, oh my God, this is a real thing. We're really going to start killing each other. We're really going to go to war with England. Whoa, let's put the brakes on this. Many colonists seem to act that way. Uh, there's a lot of really talk about compromise. It's really interesting. The middle sort of falls apart. In the First Continental Congress, you had people all spectrums. The Second Continental Congress, the following year, you're pretty much either for or against. You're pretty much either on board with war or you're completely against it. There's not much middle ground uh, at this point in time. Um, you either are with us or against us. And it turns out that the majority end up are with. Um, although, it is believed probably only a third of the colonists were really, really gung-ho war. About the other third were ambivalent and were just willing to go with whatever seemed to be the best course of action, winning or, or fighting or not fighting. Uh, ultimately, the Patriots went out, uh, the argument, ultimately. So, some moderates hope for peace. Some wanted reconciliation, and of course, the Patriots were radicals and said no. Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, among others. They called for taking up arms. Merchants cut off trade with England. England cuts off trade with us. This becomes about Congress versus King George. Now, as I said, many in the southern colonies were still very hesitant to get involved with this. Um, they are brought around, though to the Patriot side, but not through any actions of the Patriots. Ultimately, the British caused the Southerners to side with the Patriots. How's that work out? Well, this happens with what are we called loyalists. People that are loyal are loyal. When you say loyalists, we're referring to loyal to England. Probably the majority of colonists are still loyal. The majority of colonists, as I said, maybe a third are really on board with supporting the revolution. A third are really torn uh, in the middle, uh, and then the other third are very resistant, the loyalists. Well, loyalists are centered in the Southern colonies, the Carolinas region, those, those Southern colonies, Carolinas, Georgia, all that kind of stuff down there, slave colonies. Well, Lord Dunmore in Virginia, does something that was incredibly influential upon how this turns out. Lord Dunmore uh, promises freedom to slaves and indentured servants who join England in the war. You join the British side, you be willing to fight and help the Redcoats, we'll give you freedom 
and end your slavery. We'll pay off your debts, and we will free you as indentured servants. Even even pay you and give you give you uh, maybe even give you land. Well, you must understand that in the southern colonies, their entire society was based upon the oppression of blacks and poor whites. That was how the southern socio-cultural system worked. Slavery and the oppression of all the poor lower classes by the elite. Uh, Dunmore just came in and threatened to turn it all upside down and said, you know what, we're going to give the poor freedom, we're going to give the poor land, we're going to free the slaves, anyone who's willing to fight and help out with the cause. What slave owners hear is blah, 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 you're going to end slavery, take away all our land, take away all our power, and pretty much tear apart the entire white supremacist society that we've been building down here for a century. What are you doing, talking about? And so many Southerners are turned to the side of the Patriots because they are now fearful that England is actually going to end slavery because there's already been talks in England about ending slavery. By the way, England does, just 20 years or so after this, uh, technically 30, uh, 1807, England ends slavery. They, they end the, 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 uh, the, they declare slavery illegal in, in their lands. Ironically, though, there's still lots of ship captains, actually British flag ship captains that are transporting slaves. But in their actual colonies, they declare it illegal. There's already been talk in England about uh, issues with slavery. So people, especially who are loyal to England, they already know this is in the air in England. They already know many English people in Parliament are already moving away from the idea of slavery. So now we have English lords discussing ending slavery and giving freedom to them if they fight on the British side. Anyway, many Southerners, they change their loyalties almost immediately and say, all right, we're, we might have been loyal to England, but if they're going to take away our entire socio-cultural system, economic system, we're going to have to side with the Patriots because we don't want to be part of England. Because if we're part of England, they're going to destroy our entire way of life. So what Dunmore does, it really creates all kinds of fears of slave revolts, poor revolts, ending the entire slave society, which actually puts a lot of Southerners on the side of the Patriots, which really tips the balance. The balance was probably against all-out war until actions like Lord Dunmore and others. He's not the only one who does stuff like this. But the actions of Southern slave owners actually lean towards the Patriot cause. It's really almost like they're not leaning towards the Patriots, but they're leaning away from England, which, of course, pushes them towards the Patriots. Um, many people also still loved the father. They called the father the king, um, but they simply thought the government had gone too far. And so we really see that much of this revolution is against the king of England. Not so much against England itself. Many people believe the king has simply gone too far. They blame him for everything. Anything that happens ultimately falls on the shoulders of the king and parliament. So this isn't so much a rebellion against England, per se, but more rebellion against the king himself. And you'll see that in the declaration we'll talk about. The declaration is almost entirely an attack on the king of England. The declaration is almost entirely an attack on the king of England, and what we must do in response to that, because you're not treating us fairly. Thomas Paine's very important. He writes Common Sense in 1776, and he says it's common sense that everyone should be treated fairly and equally. Everyone has the same rights and, and, and uh, responsibilities. And it's simply common sense that independence and republicanism, or not political, this isn't the political party, a republicanism, a republic, which ideally a republic is a government which protects the rights of its citizens. So ideally, independence and republicanism um, are natural course of events in human history. They're really not. <laughs> As a matter of fact, human history goes the other direction. Independence and republicanism is not the natural course of human history. What he argues is it should be. Independence and, and republicanism should be the natural course of human history. He uses this sort of father-son uh, analogy, um, father-children analogy, saying that, that, in essence, England is our father, and we are the children. And what happens in the nor normal course of events, as every family deals with, 
what happens when the children grow up? They go out on their own. They become independent. They are Republican now. They're taking care of themselves. They are responsible for their own actions. And what Thomas Paine argues is it's common sense. We should be the same way. America has grown now. We've been under your tutelage, under your care for 150 years now. It's time to let us go. We are grown up. We are adults. It's, it's a simple metaphor. We're grown children now. It's time for us to be independent and free. Um, the sovereignty is constantly evaded. I, I sort of went over that, uh, glossed over that. Who really, sovereignty is really who makes the rules and the laws. Who is sovereign? England says they are. The colonists say they are. Who really has the sovereignty? The king or the people? And this is really more general. is isn't just colonists, but the argument of the colonists really would, would, would sort of spill over to England itself. Of course, it doesn't happen. But the idea is the people actually are sovereign. The people should make the decisions. Remember what I said all the way back at the beginning? One of the biggest complaints in the 60s was that these new laws and taxes did not, quote, originate with the people. The people didn't choose these laws. The people didn't elect the people in parliament. The American colonists didn't elect parliament. So whether it's direct democracy, the people actually making the laws, or whether it's representative democracy, like we have today in America, we elect our officials and then they're the ones that make the laws. We, the, uh, the colonists had neither. The colonists were losing their ability of direct democracy because England was taking away their ability to make laws and shutting down their governments. And America had no indirect democracy either. We had no representative democracy because the American colonists didn't get to choose people in parliament. So in every way, there was no sovereignty for the American colonists. And they argue they should have sovereignty. They should have the ability to determine their future and make their own laws. And Thomas Paine writes multiple things about this. And Thomas Paine is maybe the most influential author on the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. His ideas he comes up with about the common sense and republicanism and freedom and independence and equality. Bear in mind, this is mostly catered towards the upper classes. Uh, this often didn't apply to the masses of people. We think of democracy today. Our founding fathers had no actual interest in real democracy. They didn't believe anyone should be making decisions who wasn't educated and had time and energy to actually put into politics, which was only the upper classes. Common, regular people had, well, folks, many were illiterate. They didn't have education. So they did not believe in democracy. They believed in a republic, though, a republic where the government protected the rights of the citizens, all citizens. However, they didn't believe that regular citizens should be making those rules. The laws and policies should only be made by the upper class citizens, not common people. So they did not believe in democracy. They did believe in republicanism and representative government, though. Different things. Um, Congress leans towards it and finally spills over into independence. They're meeting, and they're, a lot of this meeting is really happening. I think this whole Second Continental Congress, if I didn't tell you, it, it, I think it all happens in Philadelphia. Uh, today we call it Independence Hall, and they meet there, they discuss. What they're doing is treason, by the way. What they are doing is actually treasonous. All of these men, these, I don't know, 50 or so men, 50, 60 men, something like that, who met in uh, Independence Hall and discussed for days and actually write the, de write the Declaration of Independence. They um, they were committing treason. All of them could have been hung for this or executed. Every one of them. Um, they actually wrote it and put it out around July first, and actually disseminated it to the masses in Philadelphia for them to look at and critique it. And then they went back in and they made some changes to it over the next couple of days. And then the final official versions released on July fourth. Um, they actually announce it, they release it. Uh, again, several people had already seen drafts of it previously in their community. Um, and they announce it and read it on July 4th. Thomas Jefferson wrote most of it. The, the actual words are, are primarily out of Thomas Jefferson's head, heavily influenced by Thomas Paine and other people, uh, about 80% of it. And then the other 20% are things that are tweaked and adjusted by other, other patriots. 
Uh, and their argument is, is pretty direct. They call for independence on July 4th. It was approved on July 4th by this Continental Congress, which was a extra legal or illegal body that were all potentially committing treason, uh, what they were doing, uh, and all could have been executed for this. Authored by Thomas Jefferson, mostly others, all, all of them were involved in it. The king was the villain. It was an attack on the king. Um, he plundered our seas, he ravaged our coasts, he burned our towns, he destroyed our lives. The king was portrayed as nothing short of evil, really. Um, they used enlightenment thinking to proclaim the rights of man, uh, self-evident truths, all men are created equal. Yeah. Did they really see the irony of that? A few did. A few actually wrote about it, how all men are created equal and yet we keep slaves. Uh, however, most of them seem to gloss over that. Many of them were slave owners. Jefferson was a slave owner. Washington was a slave owner. So many of them did own slaves, and they sort of, they still wrote these words with a straight face, all men are created equal. As I said, they really believed the font of liberty should be drunk by the proper people. The proper folks should enjoy liberty. Educated, entrepreneurs, business people, independent-minded folks. Your common laborer or slave or poor tenant farmer maybe didn't deserve liberty exactly. They might get to benefit from it, but the people who actually deserved it and fight for it and who really should earn, who have earned it, are the middle and upper class men of this society. These were elitist folks. These were not common people that were out there fighting for the liberty of all regular people. They were really fighting for their own personal liberty. And of course, liberty here also means money. Liberty and happiness and money often were synonymous or connected. Uh, they talk about rights of life, liberty, and happiness. Um, that is pursuit of, of pursuit of happiness as property, life, liberty, and property. You, you were not thought to be able to be happy with owning property in this time period. They, leak, they, leaked, they linked liberty and sovereignty to where the government actually gets all of its power from the people, not the king. That the people give the power to the government, not the king. Um, and Republican government. A, a Republican government governed by the people, of the people, for the people, to protect the people. Ultimately, that's what we get in the Constitution, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. That's it for this chapter. That covers everything, and thanks for going through it with me, and we will pick up right where we left off here in the next chapter.